Mountain bikes are great now, but they haven't always been. And over the history of mountain bikes, the modern era at least, have been some game changing bikes. Here's our list. Before we get into it, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. And let's start Doddy uh, with the Intense M1. Oh, probably the coolest bike of all time. It kind of feels- Let alone game changer. It feels a bit to me like the iconic downhill bike that really changed things from the 90s, like, you know, a World Cup podium was absolutely full of these bikes. And they weren't all labeled up as Intense. People would debadge their bikes and be sponsored by other brands and they'd stick their logos on this bike. People like the Athens, Road Intense M1s. Uh, Greg Minar, and quite a few legit ones as well, people like Palmer and Lopes. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to say about Minar, so he won his first World Champs on one, badged up as a Haro, I think, and, and it was actually probably the first legitimate downhill bike in an era when everyone was developing anything they could to try and a bit of an arms race, wasn't it? Exactly, they started off as McPherson and Strutt, but then moved to four bar, and that's really the that's one when it that came. took off. And like I say, uh, Kvarik won that Fort winning World Cup in 2002 by 14 seconds on this bike. Uh, pretty iconic. Yeah, he's also wearing a skin suit. No one said a thing about that. Next to the Newt Proof Mega. So this is kind of, you know, he's named after the Mega Avalanche and it gave you an idea of what was to come. People making these longer travel bikes that could be used kind of initially for those wacky events that turned into enduro bikes, really. I'm glad you referred to it as wacky events because I, I, I completely remember that era of mountain biking when it was only the French that were any good at that stuff. It was niche at the time, yeah. and now it's kind of what everyone does. Uh, so 2011, the V1 of the Mega came around, 26 inch wheels, of course, we're now on V4, 2020. It looks modern, you know, a modern version of the same bike, I guess, but a lot of the same characteristics, a bike that you can pedal all day and thrash down the Alps if you want to. Even from the beginning, it always had more travel on the front as well, yeah. which I think was a good look at the future. Also, the winner of uh, three EWS titles under the likes of Sam Hill. Also, Elliot Heap and Joe Smith have ridden, ridden those bikes as well. I'm going to throw in the Mondraker with a forward geometry. So the Foxy XR that came out in 2012. Now, this bike was only available in three sizes, but it was so dramatically longer than anything else. What they essentially did was a mountain bike in that era would have had a 70 mil stem. They put a 10 mil stem on it and they put the 60 mil on the front of the bike instead. So the reach on a size large was about 500 mil in 2012, which was bonkers. And to put it into perspective, a size extra large in an Ibis Mojo HD that I had at the time was 412 millimeters. That's crazy. Which just it? doesn't even add up on paper. My numbers now, I'm a, I'm a medium sized bike guy, I'm five foot 10. I look at the 450, 460 and that's yeah. kind of, but yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? Is that kind of, you know, is that shaped the outline of a modern bike now? Pretty much, I think that's you know where most XLs you're talking 500 mil to 515 thereabouts. So it's definitely a look at the future. I just think they had the guts to do it in a one back then. Now to what has become a sort of a class leading cross country bike. Scott Spark have always been mm. there with that bike, trying to push it as the lightest full suspension bike. We've seen the new one now; it's gone up again. It's kind of changing <laughs> the boundaries a little bit. Gone up to 120 mil standard. Will everyone else follow? but they've always been right there with the lightest full suspension cross-country bike. Yeah, and also I think introducing and adopting all of the technology. When a lot of brands out there would be sort of on, sat on the fence, yeah. the latest model there with a hidden shock, absolutely beautiful work of art. The 2019 version weighed in at 1,850 grams for the frame and the shock. Uh, obviously the latest version now is 1,870, so with bigger <laughs> wheels, all that fancy integrated shock system, like you said, a bike that we often see Nino Schurter ride in. 67 degree heading as well, it's fairly slack for a cross-country bike. It really is, well, if you consider the tat Ibis I just referenced back in 2012, that was 67 degrees. Is it? Enduro bike. Ah. Yeah, so things have moved on. Uh, speaking of enduro bikes, Santa Cruz Nomad. Arguably yeah. one of the, the first real super bikes. Yeah. We saw them early on 2005, I think, by about 2012 ish, 2014. You were. So I racing. rode the first edition, well, I rode all those bikes, yeah. And I remember that for me was the first time I'd jump. I'd had the Blur, the blur 4 Cross, which was like, whoa, this is a glimpse into the future. It's the right mm. angles, but still fairly short travel. When the Nomad came out, it was like 160 mil and uh, Took it away and I did some crazy snow race on it and I was like, wow, this thing's pretty legit. Going bombing down the ski slopes, doing massive jumps. And I think it was really, I think it was a 2016 model where you came with a, it was it the purple color? I had Envy rims on it. And that to me felt like the first super bike. Envy wheels, Chris King hubs, people looked at that bike and they wanted it. And it was proper money as well. It was one of those, you know, people, it became the first dentist bike. 100%, yeah. I think that was a line in the sand for that and the Bronson when they came out. Yeah, it really did change a lot of things. For the better? I'm sure, on the pricing. Uh, pricing wise, <laughs> yeah, I think people have an opinion on that. 
What about the Scott Genius? The first one was, I'd say, kind of an ugly duckling. It had all sorts of adjustability on there. Yeah, exactly. So different amounts of travel that you could change with all those cables. I'm not saying <laughs> it was the best looking bike. It also, it felt to me like it was a bit too lightweight. So they're trying to give you loads of travel, but actually the type of riders that rode it, like one of my friends, it wouldn't last very long. The frames are a bit too lightweight, shall I say. Yeah, they were mega light, and that, yeah, you're right, the equaliser shock with a, with a pool chambers on it, it had two separate chambers with a, kind of like a barbecue spatula set up on the handlebars <laughs> yeah. to, to change between the settings, but fair play to them for pushing tech on that much. And it kind of paved the way for bikes to be, you know, long travel that you can paddle as well, and we've kind of gone through different eras of, even things like the Canyon Strive, where like they've thought of different ways of doing it, and we've kind of got to bikes now that, do you really want to change travel on them? Maybe not, but actually a longer travel bike that you can pedal seems to be the, the sort of the definitely golden recipe. Big lure, isn't it? Yeah. Um, Commissar Supreme. Come on, that bike has always been in there. It's always been a racer's bike. Uh, I think, you know, the background of Max Commissar with what he's achieved in the past, yeah. the people who's had racing on the bikes, and we've already seen what this bike has been capable of over what, the last five years? Yeah, we've got some some of the sort of heritage ridden right, people like Cedric Gracia, the Athens, Miriam Cole, but I guess it's more the modern era with the, the magic high carpet pivot. and mm. that, yeah, high pivot where we've seen it, uh, dominate's probably not quite the word, but some of those amazing wins we've seen on the World Cup circuit have been with people arriving that Commonwealth Supreme. We're now on V5, yeah, high pivot, 220 mil, you've got the MX version, you've got, 29 front, 27 rear, 63.2 degree head angle. Yeah, one of the most successful downhill bikes of the modern era. Maybe slightly controversially, but I think this is a big one, it is a Specialized Turbo Levo, introduced in 2015. Was it the first e-mountain bike to ride good and look good? Definitely the first one to look good. Yeah. yeah they, they did change a lot with that nice shaped down tube and stuff. And they were probably the first big brand, at least, to get rid of all that gunk. You know, people realise that not all serious mountain bikers want all the big screens. They want to choose if they have yeah. them, but they don't want all that stuff on the bars. Want it to look super integrated, so no display. You've got tiny little LEDs there. Uh, and it actually became the benchmark. Or I think all the other manufacturers looked at that bike and said, right, I think that's what we need to do. And, and it's still that way now, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if nothing else, you've got to thank them for um, putting the batteries internally on the frames yeah. and neatening things up. Makes a lot of sense. Trek Session 10. A lot of downhill bikes look like the Trek Session for good reason. It was a really good layout. Uh, so it kind of appeared to be like a four bar configuration, but running this split pivot style system on the back that they call ABP on the Trek bikes. Uh, up to the modern ones now, of course, it's got a high pivot on there, which is very much a buzzword in downhill, but probably, again, one of the most successful bikes under a lot of races over the years. Does everything still look like a session? Oh, a lot of bikes still do, yeah. I think a lot of them look like common sense as well, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, on to the Specialized Enduro 29er, which in many people's eyes was like the turning point for 29ers when they went from kind of a bit of an oddity, like I can remember the Gary Fisher's like, yeah, it's something, but is it something that a lot of people will want? And I think this was the first bike where Enduro riders, racers looked and thought, that probably is the future. Yeah, and do you know what? Like, e even without going too back and archival about it, the they named a bike the Enduro in about 2005, I think it was, yeah. before Enduro was even a thing. So they kind of had had the right sort of gameplay in place there. But yeah, again, one of the massively successful bikes. Up to 170 mil travel nowadays, 63.9, hovering around 64 degree head angle. You've also got things like the swap box. I guess that's kind of changed again a bit as well. You're seeing a lot of uh, sandwich boxes on these bikes nowadays. All right, maybe slightly left field here, getting away from the really high-end fancy bikes, but what about the Calibre Boss Nut, Dolly? 100%, yeah, I remember when they developed that bike, uh, so you could buy it in the UK and they'd go outdoors chain, so even that was great, an outdoor chain of stores, so you go and buy your tents and all your outdoor stuff, get the bikes, hand-picked components. Yeah, like, we've had shops like Halfords that sell kind of all right bikes, but this was the first, it felt like the first, thousand pound bike that Plus was real the, bike yeah the right yeah. angles the right material the right components on there and now it's sort of paved the way forward because we've got people like rock rider jamis polygon vetus all doing these right angled bikes that aren't going to break the bank yeah you know I, I made a video for for gmbn recently on that top of the range vetus mathie camp and the top spec one was two and a half grand yeah and it is incredible it's like a super bike but like not on a super bike budget. Exactly, and whilst we do love the, the high-end, really fancy bikes, like I always say, is like mountain biking can be expensive, but nowadays it can probably be cheaper than ever as well. Certainly much more affordable. 
On to another slightly different one, but I think these game-changing bikes are sort of, for me, it's a bike that people love, or you'll just see lots of them. There's a sudden wave of them, and YT with their Capra. Yeah. All of a sudden, the UK market was flooded with these bikes, it seemed. Yeah, and it seemed smart as well to take on the direct sales approach, which was, I think at the time, so unfamiliar that a lot of people weren't even sure about them. Yeah. You're right, they were everywhere. Probably not the first brand to do it, but the first brand to make an impact, I would say, within mountain bike. With a bike like that, I think, yeah. yeah this is sure. going to be cheaper because you don't have to spend the money on distributors and shops. So the consumer gets them cheaper and it's a proper bike and the marketing looks good and it's a bike that everyone wanted. All right, so that's our list of the game-changing bikes. Yeah, but are we completely off the mark and just sort of thought of the ones we like the best? Uh, there must be some other amazing game-changing bikes. Why don't you fill us in down there? Give us a thumbs up.